Hi, everyone. Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb. You know, we've been uh, reporting a lot on the urban air mobility market, and, and in the Zoom window opposite me is Pat Anderson from Embry-Riddle, who's really uh, been involved with monitoring and maybe being involved uh, directly in some of the development of these vehicles. And Pat, we've talked about this a couple of times. We've done a lot of coverage on it. It ain't happening quite the way we had hoped. I'm sure it's, uh, Uber, it's not happening for Uber the way they would hope either. And what do you see as the limitations here? What's, uh, why isn't this thing taking off? It seems like the FAA got on board and the regulatory uh, uh, structure is there. Well, I think it's, it's, it's complicated and it's a, uh, a summation of three things, probably the certification regime, the, uh, uh, the technical aspects and public uh, acceptance uh, of these types of vehicles. But I do see it happening behind the scenes. So uh, it's not like it's, it's not happening. It does appear to be coming along, but I think it's gonna take a lot longer than everybody uh, thought. And so on the technical side, I think one of the areas uh, that is a little bit misunderstood is the, uh, the battery aspect. And it would be great if we could power these with uh, batteries because that would be the cleanest form of transportation technology we could deploy. But uh, as far as the energy carrying capability of batteries right now with respect to weight, uh, it doesn't come close to our liquid fuels, which means we don't have the range and endurance that we need. And so in the FARs, uh, our, our VFR reserves is sort of written in blood uh, and our IFR reserves. And right now, battery only um, UAMs are, are struggling to match those uh, reserve numbers. So they're trying to stretch the performance of the aircraft or they're trying to uh, uh, change those rules to reduce uh, the, the requirements. And that's one of the big struggles with the regulations. Having said that, uh, I think the FAA has embraced uh, trying to bring in new and novel things. The uh, FAR Part 23 rewrite and move to consensus standards has really helped this, um, but there's, there's no substitute for experience. So uh, with these new and novel technologies, even though there is a certification path, uh, it appears that the FAA would like to really see testing um, that would prove that these technologies are ready for prime time. And I think the third thing is really public acceptance. And so it's really hard to imagine that the first deployment of these uh, are gonna be in an urban environment over people's heads before uh, some other path proves out the reliability of this technology. Uh, let me ask you about that regulatory requirement. Uh... Do, will these UAM vehicles have to meet the basic uh, VFR reserve requirement? Well, that's what is in the rules right now. Having said that, there are a lot of the companies that are trying to put forward to the FAA uh, exemptions of that to try and um, remove, for example, the 30-minute VFR uh, reserve requirement because the specific energy of the batteries is just such that it will only allow a short hop right now. And so, I think this is a, a sort of debate within the community right now of whether we should apply those uh, reserves to battery powered aircraft or not. Um, I've been involved with some hybrid power plants. And so um, the hybrids are actually uh, can store more energy. So while they look like a battery in that they produce the electricity needed for uh, multi-copters and, and uh, transitioning type urban air mobility or cargo vehicles, uh, those vehicles can potentially do four hops and still have the 30 minute reserve. Now, the, the counter to that is, is that it's not as green as batteries. And, and so there's this sort of love affair with batteries because they can be the uh, cleanest technology, but I'm not sure that we can directly make that jump. Um, sort of similar to the automotive um, industry, they were able to deploy uh, 20 years ago, some very basic electric cars, what, what really took off uh, was the hybrids because it had the, uh, the capabilities of cars that people expected. Uh, and now the battery technology in automotive, which is different than aviation, it's basically how much capacity you have for the cost of the battery is approaching a cost that makes electric, uh, fully electric autos uh, viable. And I think you're going to see that play out in this environment too, that we can meet the range and endurance requirements that are written in blood if we use hybrids. Uh, but I think 
I'm pretty bullish on long term for batteries, but I just don't think that's here now. I think that's probably 10 to 15 years out, just like we saw in the automotive industry. It's my impression, and maybe I'm wrong here, but you you'd have a better feel for it, that there's kind of been a, a growing awareness that, that the uh, battery uh, energy density and power density is not going to come fast enough to make these things commercially viable, and therefore we're seeing more and more hybrid projects. We are, but I, I think there's still a lot of people in denial on that, to be quite honest. And I think this is not the most difficult math uh, to do, but we still pe see people embracing uh, battery only. Uh, the good news is, is that there are several hybrid um, companies standing up that uh, can provide the energy and power required for mission enabling UAMs. And so one of the things I say is that uh, this electric propulsion enables missions that you can't do with conventional uh, engines. So you got to think that sometimes a serial hybrid, if you draw a control volume around that, wouldn't be as efficient as a conventional uh, propulsion system. In other words, why not hook a propeller directly to it? Why would you put things that aren't 100% efficient between the propeller and the engine? And the answer is there are configurations and missions that you can't fly with that. So there is a reason to go to electric propulsion that can be greener, both from a emission standpoint, a noise standpoint, and a uh, reliability and, and failure rate standpoint that uh, makes this electric propulsion uh, look attractive, but again, I think the energy aspects of it are going to drive us towards hybrid initially uh, and less towards the battery only market. I think that uh, people, what people don't get, uh, particularly in aviation, don't get about the hybrid idea is that it's not really like a car because with with electricity available, you're able to do distributed power. Uh, you can you can put thrust you can put lift all over the airplane or aircraft that you can't do uh, with uh, any kind of mechanical system and that's that's where the advantage is that's absolutely right so that that's what i mean by a mission enabling technology is that uh, you know if you look at a v22 osprey that took years and years to bring that aircraft uh, into service and now it's a a widely used and highly regarded aircraft but the, uh, the mechanical crossover uh, to be able to fly on one engine in that is a mechanical nightmare. You could just imagine now a smaller vehicle with uh, the necessity to have eight rotors, to have the reliability uh, and noise emissions that you want, and you find that that's just not viable uh, with a mechanical system. And so uh, it's not really competing against a helicopter or one of those because you really can't make a helicopter fly the, the missions that these fly. So uh, this technology of either battery or hybrid electric, I think hybrid electric for the first couple of years, uh, enables these mission profiles that are safe and green and potentially could be deployed in an urban setting once the technology is proven out. I talked to uh, Pipistrel this week. I, uh, yesterday I flew their uh, Pipistrel Panthera, which uh, is now powered by a gasoline engine, a light coming. At one point, they had envisioned uh, a hybrid version of this, and the hybrid cycle would be, it's uh, basically a gasoline engine uh, with a generator uh, and sufficient batteries, probably in the wings, uh, to, for the airplane to be able to take off on the electric power only. Uh, as, and the advantage was seen as noise, and high density altitude operations since an electric motor isn't affected by density altitude. Uh, but now they are thinking that that's uh, less of a, a, a market reality uh, against the efficiency of the, of the gasoline engine. Uh, but that gets us into hybrids. You're working on a, a hybrid generator project there. I know there are a lot of other ones around. Are the students there at Embry-Riddle uh, tilting more towards the hybrid idea? Well, I think they are because uh, I'm teaching a class now, both an undergraduate engineering class and a graduate engineering class in electrified propulsion. And so we go out and we study the batteries that are available. And then we, we try and forecast looking at the history of battery chemistry development, what we'll have in the near future. And it becomes pretty clear that uh, 
for much more than a couple of minutes of endurance at a relatively large scale. The math simply tells us that the current battery chemistries don't have the energy uh, requirement that we need. And, and so you look at alternatives to enable that mission, it can be only flown with say eight rotors or 12 rotors. Uh, and, and that brings you around to the hybrid works very well there because it looks like a battery except for it has uh, four times the specific energy for a short range mission. And uh, if you have longer range missions, it looks even better than that. It may be as much as 10 times uh, the specific energy of a battery. And so uh, the students here are coming around to that. Again, there's, there's sort of a love affair with batteries because uh, production of electricity on the ground can certainly be very, very low emissions uh, and certainly lower noise level. I just don't think we can make that giant step with the technology we have right now today, whereas we can partially make that step and get ready and figure out all the downstream rotors and motors uh, with hybrid technology that uh, can provide us with the energy we need and the reserves uh, that we want to feel safe. As I understand it, the students you're teaching are, are probably uh, a lot more environmentally conscious and greener than my generation and your generation. Uh, so they are kind of having to make a compromise there by the sounds of it. They are. So uh, again, you know, they'd like to see the batteries work, but it, it becomes real clear. In fact, in the first couple of uh, classes, uh, one of the things we do is um, derive sort of the hybrid or electric airplane equivalent of conservation of mass, which is to say we take very fundamental parameters, which ends up being L over D, the aerodynamic efficiency, basically translates to uh, an equivalent to battery specific energy. You can equate those two particular things. And when, when you look at uh, the L over D of an aircraft and the uh, endurance and how that relates to battery specific energy, without a whole lot of math, you come to the conclusion that you need a higher specific energy uh, than a battery. So while, while they would like to be at that uh, bullish point of batteries, and I think we'll be there in 10 to 15 years, they're realistic uh, and they're willing to take a half step instead of a full step to make sure that we can get there uh, in a, a safe way and, and a commercially viable way. I mean, if, if you only have 10 or 15 minutes of endurance, it's unlikely that that is commercially viable and that that will be deployed wide scale. Uh, and so just to see this industry stand up and get moving, I think they're willing to uh, look at hybrid solutions in addition to just battery. And it, it's important to note that even hybrids have batteries with them. Uh, a battery can put out uh, tremendous amounts of power. So when you look at an eVTOL aircraft, or something that takes off vertically and gets under wing, um, a, a generator or a serial hybrid with a high power battery, uh, they're complementary. So you could use a battery for takeoff and then use the energy stored in gasoline for your, your lower power cruise. And so almost every hybrid has a, uh, a battery with it. There's other technical reasons for uh, electrical bus uh, regulation that uh, that you need a battery as well. So it, it's a component of that. Um, so they're not not being exposed to batteries. It's just a different usage of that battery right now. Are, are the commercial interests, the commercial side, the uh, venture capitalists and the investors uh, kind of getting wise to the battery situation? Well, I, I sort of hope so because it's been a, a very strange environment um, and I guess I can see why it's been a strange environment. Uh, years ago, if you had a small model of something novel and you could prove that it would fly, uh, scaling that up would, would probably work. So when you took that to an investor and said, look at this small version, we're gonna scale this up to a larger version and it should work, uh, that typically did. Here, it's the opposite. We've found two scaling laws that really prohibit uh, scaling up of, uh, fixed uh, pitch rotor blade multi-copters to say the Avengers aircraft carrier to say it kiddingly uh, or, or any sort of man-sized vehicle. One is the one we've been talking about quite a bit which is the battery scaling uh, and you can overcome that with again a hybrid system right now uh, but then there are still people trying to use fixed pitch rotor blades and we've done some um, master's theses on 
looking at how, how you scale up those fixed pitch rotor blades because they're being used not only for propulsion but attitude control. And so you gotta change the RPM to change the thrust to control the attitude of it. And as the rotor blade grows in a bigger vehicle, what ends up happening is you either introduce a big lag into your control system or your electric motor gets so heavy that your thrust to weight ratio goes down. Uh, there's a solution to that as well, using more helicopter-like technology with a collective and cyclic solves that, but now we're not talking about somebody in their garage making an octocopter-like vehicle. We're talking about a real aerospace company that knows how to make multiple uh, rotor heads uh, that'll have cyclic and collective. And I believe you said in that scale effect that the, uh, the weight and the complexity can outrun the the thrust delivered, so you end up with not enough power. That's right. So if you take this fixed pitch rotor blade and you say that you want to be able to roll from side to side in a certain amount of time, that, that requires the rotors to slow down on one side and speed up. And you have to overcome the inertia because you're, you're changing the speed uh, of that rotor. And, and so if you hold the ability to roll left to right constant, what ends up happening as the rotor grows and the inertia of that grows and you have to overcome inertia because you're not running at constant speed like a helicopter, the, the motor grows faster than the rotor. So it's like the old square cube law that uh, aero people would talk about uh, with, uh, you know, World War II airplanes in that as the rotor grows, the electric motor weight that is associated to spin that at the same speed gets faster quicker and so the thrust to weight ratio of that pod drops and and really there's there's sort of a uh, a limit to that at about uh, six foot rotor this becomes uh, dimin diminishing returns and we see that if we look around we don't see anybody out there with uh, very big rotors that have good control power out of these uh, fixed pitch blades uh, on octocopters on so when we when we see these things pop up in the news, uh, and if I'm looking through the eyes of Pat Anderson, what should we be thinking about some of these things? I mean, they, they, they look very intriguing and like they're full of promise, but uh, they're not really around the corner, are they? No, so a lot of these are, are stood up by people that uh, um, are able to mimic what you see in a DJI uh, obviously, DJI is, is well tuned, but the uh, the control laws uh, for an octocopter and being able to use a battery powered lightweight uh, multi-copter system is is pretty easy. So you see a whole bunch of these, and at one of the uh, the sizes that you can actually do before you hit this limit is sort of these flying motorcycle things, which are these these octocopters. And I think people fly these, and 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 they're trying to have you envision that these organizations can take this and simply scale it up to a four scale, uh, four seat car designed by a year or two from now. And they're up against these physical limits. And unfortunately they haven't uh, typically done the math and they, they don't know that they're up against the limits. So while it looks very impressive to fly these uh, motorcycle looking things, um, they're at about the limit of technology and they're gonna have to employ technology that is more akin to a large aerospace company or at least a, a well-funded startup uh, to get past these very complicated scaling laws. Okay, well, um, we're watching all this, uh, Pat, and uh, I know every few months I'm probably going to be calling you to kind of for a reality check here. Uh, we appreciate the update. Very good. Glad to be a part of it. This is Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb. We've been talking with Dr. Pat Anderson of Embry-Riddle University. Thanks for watching.